Hey all, Baruch Levy, be here from the Defiant Spirit. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I have made the shift over from Soul Centered, which is still Ariella, my wife's, and I. It's our it's our company, um, and we still operate under Soul Centered. But my focus and passion is around the Defiant Spirit. Um, hers is around her brand. She's getting a new website here pretty soon, so you can still get a hold of Ariella at mysoulcentered.org, but mine is now all over at Defiant Spirit. For those of you who've been following the journey, um, really just getting deeper and more entrenched into the roots of Dr. Viktor Frankl. I'm a logotherapist, meaning-centered, more than therapy. It's it's healing, which is what therapy means, but it's, it's living, guidance. Um, we need purpose. We need meaning. We need direction. And so that's really where I draw a lot of my wisdom, also still continuing to draw from many spiritual traditions, but applying it through the lens of the Enneagram. So the Enneagram, an ancient system of energy, it has been most recently adapted into a personality psychological sort of roadmap. Um, but it really, the deep roots and the modern application just speak to me tremendously. So merging all that together is the defiant spirit and working in both individual settings and with corporate or organizational clients to bring the Enneagram to individuals, to families. And I'm very also very excited about bringing it to companies. I have seen it as a transformative system for clearer communication, for understanding not only who we are, I think there are some great personality tools out there for understanding who we are, but why we do what we do. And that is the true genius of the Enneagram. It has nine sort of foundational motivations. What drive us? Now that, you know, that motivation is complex. There's fear, there's suffering, there's aspiration, you know, there's all kinds of things in there. Each type has different components, but there are nine fundamental strategies, if you will. I will say before we jump into Enneagram 7, some types have a harder time than others allowing themselves to be engaged by something like a personality type, like a typing system. Some resist it more than others. And what we're going to explore today is Enneagram 7, The Enthusiast, because if you've been following me the past few weeks, I've been making my rounds uh, around the Enneagram, as you can see behind me if you're online. If not, you just listen. Um, the Wheel of the Enneagram, we just started at 1 and we've worked our way around to 7. So 7, 8, 9, we'll wrap it up and then we'll go on to a new set of conversations. Um, I would say of all of them that dislike the Enneagram the most would be Enneagram 7 and Enneagram 4. And maybe to some degree Enneagram 2, but for different reasons. They're also, they all happen to be what are called the idealists in the Enneagram. So there are many different triads. One of the triads is the... Um, triad that puts them into the positive outlook. It's how they navigate the world. So it's called the um, the Harmony Triad. And it's, it's, it's interesting because seven, two, and four tend to be the ones who say, you know, B, I don't, I can't be labeled. I, I, I just can't be reduced to a number. I would agree. I mean, my entire premise of my work is you can't be labeled. You can't be reduced to a number. God forbid. That's the takeaway. I would never want to reduce somebody because the foundation of my work, Viktor Frankl, is uh, we can destroy each other when we reduce one another to a label, to a box, to a number. He bore his, um, his philosophy and psychology out of the Holocaust, where human beings were reduced to numbers, were reduced to ashes because of that. So no, I would not want to reduce anybody to a number. But the truth is, for all my fours, sevens, and twos, the helpers, the individuals, and the enthusiasts, I don't reduce you to a number, you reduce you to a number. And an Enneagram 7, as we'll get into, oftentimes will say, you know, I'm just too much for a number, I'm too free for a number, I, I don't want to be limited. That's your number, that's your box, that's your prison. Sevens can end up in the prison of, I, I won't end up in prisons, right? So that freedom, that limitlessness is ironically what can get a, an Enneagram 7, the enthusiast, into trouble. But again, 
each type has their box, their, their prison, and we put ourselves into it. The work of the Enneagram, the true work, not the garbage, you know, um, pop Enneagram that oftentimes I see out there, but the true Enneagram is it's an ancient system to see where we've outsourced our power, where we've, you know, in the ancient world, it was idolatrous. What do we give our power over to other than what Frankel calls the defiant power of the human spirit of your power, your spirit? The, uh, you know, the, um, the crux of my work is built on, as many of you know, this, this famous statement by Viktor Frankl that says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth, our happiness, and our freedom. So our power to choose our response. And I want to help you get unstuck, get un prisoned, I don't know, get uh, to break out. I keep seeing the Shawshank Redemption, right? So I want to be like uh, Andy Dufresne and the, Sh the Shawshank Redemption and help you crawl through uh, the walls, the obstacles, the roadblocks. We'll crawl underneath the prison um, through, you know, five miles of shit if we have to, like Andy Dufresne and Shawshank. And we will be free, hopefully a little less messy. Probably not, though. It's not an easy journey. So let's get into Enneagram 7 so we can be free. Now, even if you're not a 7, you have all these numbers in you. Um, it may not be your core type. If you don't know which type you are, reach out to me. We'll give you a proper assessment. Not this um, free or $10 assessment, but a real assessment that's scientifically validated, that's rock solid. We'll get you there. Or you can figure it out on your own. You have that power. But the bottom line is it may not be your core type. If it's not your core type, maybe it's part of your whole type. Your whole type is the way you think feel and act. So even if you don't think like a, I mean, even if it's not your core type, you might think like a seven because five, six, and seven are the way we think behind me. Five, six, and seven are the thinking triad. And so you're going to have one of those as your sort of default thinking operational system. And if it's not in your core type and it's not in your whole type, then it's going to be rank ordered in your um, all, all nine numbers. They're all within you. Or maybe it's your wing, or maybe it's your line. It's relevant. You don't need to have it as your type in order to engage it, in order to learn from it, to grow from it personally. And also, I guarantee you, you have sevens in your life. So who the heck are these sevens? As many of you know, I have a program now called Defy Your Number. It is, I'm so proud of it. I put in a ton of work to it. There are nine types, so each type has an ebook. Each type will soon have a workbook, um, and that'll be available to you soon. The ebook's already ready for you, and I'll have videos to go with each ebook based on each core type. And this is the one. This is page one. I'm only gonna share with you page one right now, and you can get all 41 pages of type seven in the program. I'll share with you a few pages, but we'll, we'll never have time to go through all 41. And so you can do it yourself. I will have a DIY version, or you can do it with me, or you can do it in small groups. Stay tuned. Lots of good stuff happening. But this is a slide from seven. Now, if you're listening, I will describe everything you need play by play. Have no worries. But if you are watching, and you're looking, you're seeing pictures of famous people, obviously a handful, a smattering of famous sevens, but you start to get a vibe. Um, Jim Carrey, Enthusiast Elton John, Howard Stern, Magic Johnson, Susie Orman, Miley Cyrus, Katie Couric, Brad Pitt, Robert Downey Jr., Leonardo DiCaprio, Cameron Diaz, George Clooney, Tina Turner, Steven Spielberg, um, Britney Spears, Mick Jagger, Kate Perry, Conan O'Brien, the list goes on and on and on. Obviously, I chose recognizable figures because it brings to life and light, I think, the vibe of a seven. Sevens are properly named the enthusiast, sometimes also properly called the optimist, the visionary, the seeker, the epicure, people who like experience, people who like joy. I mean, like, okay, everybody likes joy, but the Enneagram 4, the individualist, is not going to be described by joy. They're going to be described by, no offense fours, suffering. And they can transform suffering into something beautiful, into gorgeous pieces of art. But that's their medium. They deal in sort of the dark emotion and the suffering. 
Sevens are the exact opposite. That's why they're almost opposite of them on the Enneagram. Not quite opposite, but pretty darn close. Um, sevens deal in, if, if fours deal in shadow and sort of depth, um, sevens deal in light and height. They don't, they prefer not to go beneath the surface, at least up into a certain age or a certain kind of place in life. They'll skim the surface. They'll have fun. I mean, I'm just going to share with you some driving principles and values of sevens. Obviously, this is not exhaustive. If you want exhaustive and to be exhausted, uh, jump into my Defy Your Number program and I'll get you Enneagram 7, all you wanted to know and more. But sevens are, they go wide, not deep. They can go deep. Remember, choose your response. You can defy your number. You can do anything. But unconscious, reaction, on autopilot, they'll go wide. They have to be led to go deep. Whereas fours go deep and they have to sort of be led to go wide. So what does it mean to go wide? To experience it all. You know, when I hang out with sevens, I feel like sometimes I'm drinking from the fire hose. It's like, I can't digest all of this sevenness. It's it's sometimes reactive. It feels a little ADHD-ish. It's a lot of sort of scattershot, go in different directions. There's so much energy that sevens have that I think no other type has maybe except for the eight, possibly the three, the achiever or the eight, the challenger. I'm an eight. But my energy does not go wide. I go deep. I'm a hunter. So when I do a project, I like deep dive. I'm intense. I can't even lift my head up. I put so much sort of single focus power into it. Whereas sevens don't concentrate their energy. They disperse their energy. And you can feel it because let's say they're in a party. They sort of become the life of the party because their energy just goes wide. Even if they're not extroverts, although I think sevens tend towards extroversion. Um, but it's not fair to say they're all extroverts. I haven't met a seven who can't do the extroversion thing. Whether or not it's their sort of default, that's really up to them. But most sevens are going to be extroverted, at least for a period of time in their lives, certainly up until 30s, 40. 40 to me is a real pivotal time. I mean, obviously not a hard stop at 40. For some, it might be earlier. For some, it might be later. For some, it might be never. But 40 is a very important shift for sevens more than most other types because they go wide, they have energy to do everything. You know, they don't want to miss out. They want to have fun. They want to have many opportunities, many experiences, and many partners. For sevens, up until a certain point, it's easier to change your your road trip, your vacation, or your partner than it is to go back to the same location. Um, and so it's totally appropriate in your teenage years, in your 20s. Something starts to happen, though, you know, as you live life, as you get into your later 20s, your 30s, there comes a point where there's an inflection point where it's no longer fun. It's certainly no longer admirable. We, start, we stop looking up at and start looking down at, like that sort of shallow, surfacey person at a certain point. Case in point, probably the stereotypical seven is Hugh Hefner. Hugh Hefner crossed over from, whoa, I want to be Hef, to, oi, right? This, this old man in his 80s has like four girlfriends that are literally young enough to be his granddaughters, great-granddaughters, it, it crossed over into pathetic. I don't know when that happened. It certainly happened prior to 80. Um, I do think it's a 40-year-old shift. When I work with sevens, they're invariably 40 or older. If they're not, they can try and go deep, and they may very well, and you can be the one who defies that seven, but they won't necessarily stick with it. Because that wide scattershot energy takes them to the next shiny object, to the next self-development system or teacher. And so I have yet to have a 
Um, seven who's under the age of 40, stick with it. I have sevens who are over 40 who have stuck with it, especially the subtype that's social seven, which is a counter type. I won't go deep into it, but they look very different than sevens. But even those who are self-present sexual, again, subtypes, you don't need to worry about it. They can go deep if the following happens in my limited experience. One, they hit a certain age and they can't power through life anymore or they don't want to or it's diminishing returns. They're just not getting enough bang for the buck. Um, two, they crash. Oftentimes sevens will crash around addiction because that party, that fun, that go wide, not deep can get them into trouble. Their passion is called gluttony in the Enneagram system. And that means obviously that too much drink, too much food, but it isn't about drink or food. It's about excess, right? All more, more, more. And then anything in outside of us that we're consuming to feel good, to, to feel joy, it's going to be diminishing returns and they need more and they get less. And so they hit a crash point and maybe they realize they're addicts. I've worked with um, some Enneagram sevens who are recovering alcoholics. I think that's a big one that hits sevens because it's such a social drug. So that can bring them out to a crash. Divorce. I've known a bunch of sevens who have gone through sort of a midlife divorce because their spouse wants more and they're not getting it from the seven. And so the seven has to learn the hard way or the consequences of going wider, not deeper. Um, death of a parent, I think, is a big one for a seven, especially male sevens I've seen, that until a parent dies, this is all kind of a joke. It's all kind of a game. And they're players. They're, they're you know, skimming the surface of life. And then a parent dies and it brings them to their knees. Um, all kinds of ways that we can be shattered, shattered, uh, Kabbalistic kind of idea of a shvira, of a, of a shattering, more than just like a heartache or heartbreak, a shattering where our reality is totally fractured. And it's an opening. We have an opportunity. Sevens try and avoid that shattering and you can avoid it until you can't. You get to a certain age, which is come full circle, that there's just no way around it. Now you can continue to put your head down and focus on the non-shattered parts of your life, but you pay a price. You end up as a Hugh Hefner, sort of a caricature, a joke. And most people who are listening to this are not going to want to, you know, walk that path. That's why you're listening to this. And, and if you're a stereotypical seven, then you just turned it off because, oh God, the Enneagram eight is just going dark and deep and fractured. And maybe, you know, maybe we just lost some sevens who aren't yet ready to do the work. But guess what? They'll probably be back because ultimately they, um, they can't escape the dark realities that we all have to face in life. So the superpower of a seven, though, coming back to the light and the dark, some people will say to me, man, B, why do we always have to deal with the shadows and the painful stuff and the suffering? Because, A, I'm a eight hole and I, I just my job in life is I was told once a long time ago when I was a rabbi to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I never got the comfort, the afflicted part down, but I've always been good at afflicting the comfortable. B, you don't need this B to tell you just the light and the uh, positive stuff. Um, you know, go find yourself a, a nice Enneagram 9 or 2, and they'll probably be more inclined to do that. C, I think the growth work is really what this is all about. And I think that the shadows are interesting. I think that they offer us the most juice and we need to be able to find our defined spirit. And I rarely find it on mountaintops. I always find it in the valleys. So I'm going to take you down the valley, but not without the mountaintops. Enneagram sevens are superheroes and their superpower is enthusiasm, but not this bullshit enthusiasm. Um, we're talking about the kind of enthusiasm that comes deep from inside, that comes from, as we say in Yiddish, the kishkes. I'm thinking of Dalai Lama enthusiasm. I think he's a seven. Some say he's a nine. I think he's a seven because when I see the Dalai Lama, there's just this joy that comes like 
manifesting outward. It's like from an inside outward. It's an explosion of joy. His smile radiates it, but it's not a bullshit, you know, fake laughing kind of laughter, outside laughter. Lots of comedians are sevens, but it's an outward sort of persona. And I'm talking about like fiber in their fiber. They're just joyful enthusiastic, entheos, the divine from within. And their divinity is this light. It's a, it's illuminating. It's, people talk about sevens and nines and twos, the positive type, the positive outlook, as um, sort of almost the contagious positivity. And sevens of all of them have this. They're likened sometimes to the sun, to solar power. You know, Solar power is, we got to figure out how to harness this thing because it's never going to run out. I mean, not in our lifetime, not in the next million, billion years. We just have to be able to, this is the work of a seven, harness it so we can store it, so we can draw upon it. Because when the clouds set in, I have a solar powered RV. It's a gas power, it's a diesel powered RV, but part of the system works off of solar power. And so the interior lighting does. And on cloudy days, I got to figure out alternative ways to light those lights inside. Well, that's uh, that's Enneagram sevens, because if they're only sort of outside drawing, drinking that energy of the world in the experience, the road trips, the fun, the you've picked their Enneagram seven enthusiasm. If it's coming from the outside, they're dependent on something. They're ultimately victims, like we all are, if we're dependent on what's outside of us. But when they become powerful is when they discover it within. And when they don't discover it within, they can collapse under the the weight of the false front. Laughing, big, you know, telling jokes, big persona, big look at me, kind of I'm fun, I'm having fun. And then on the inside, they can be empty, they can be dying. Case in point, um, tragically, Robin Williams, a famous seven who made us laugh, but on the inside was obviously dying. And in 2000, was it 15? He, he killed himself because that mask didn't match up to his inner reality. Jim Carrey is somewhere, I think, in between the Dalai Lama and Robin Williams, a blessed memory, because Jim Carrey, the mask, remember that movie? That stupid movie. I mean, maybe it was funny, but it was stupid funny. Like all Jim Carrey movies up to a certain point. Jim Carrey. Um, um, Jim Carrey never. Sorry, I just got uh, buzzed here by actually an Enneagram 7. Coincidentally. Jim Carrey got tired of the mask. Got tired of playing that game. Got tired of living a life where everybody else was laughing. So I guess like a lot of sevens, he hit a point break and I was watching a documentary about him a while back and that point break came when his girlfriend killed herself and he woke up and he realized, you know, that he was living a lie, that on the inside he wasn't laughing and it was time to align his life with from a deeper place, a deeper set of values. And so his superpower, I think his real true genius has come in the past few years when he walked away from being a uh, comedian and has gone into on a spiritual quest, just a remarkable journey to watch him. Or another famous seven that has done something similar, um, really similar, is uh, Vladimir Zelensky. You know, look at Zelensky. Uh, basically the Jim Carrey of Ukraine a few years back, literally a comedic actor. And now that's not how most of us think of um, Vladimir Zelensky. We think of him as, well, the inspirational source of strength that sevens just have the potential to be. They, they are able to rise up with charisma, with a power like few other types because they they just radiate energy and it makes people want to get in line and follow their natural born leaders. We want to be in their presence and we really want to be in their presence when they take responsibility, when they grow up. You know, Peter Pan was supposedly a seven-ish 
kind of figure. And he's the boy who doesn't want to grow up. And the world starts passing him by. And there's a pain, you know, painful feeling that Peter has when he sees Wendy and the others growing up. And he's living in Never Never Land with the Lost Boys. So Vladimir Zelensky really crossed that threshold into manhood, into adulthood, into seven responsibility, or as Viktor Frankl says, responsibility, the ability to respond to life. And that's the shift of the seven. When they take responsibility, when they pay attention to the details, when they fulfill their duties, when they stop running to the future, running after every shiny object, running after every idea, and they ground down, they make their defiant stand, and they grow up. So, you know, my challenge for the sevens under 40 is to defy your number and grow up before life forces you to grow up. And if you're at any age and you've faced the shattering, then this is a painful blessing. I wouldn't wish it upon you. I don't have to wish it upon you. This is life. It's constantly presenting to us shatterings. The question is, are we going to turn away? Are we going to, you know, put on our Hugh Hefner cap and and kind of continue to live in Never Never Land? Or are we going to use this as a chance, a, a chance to make our stand and to summons the defiant power of the human spirit to go into the shadows, into the negativity, into the darkness, and transform that darkness into light. This is the Enneagram 7. This is the work we're all here to do. They just simply um, embody it a little more intensely. They model it a little more vibrantly, and they inspire us a little more, well, inspirationally than most other types. You all have so much to offer. We want to be near you. We want to be around you. We especially want to be like you when you give us all of you, not just the sunny days. We like the cloudy overcast as well. Um, So we want all of you and thank you, really. Thank you to our Defiant Spirit Sevens. That's an overview of the seven. Hopefully it gives you a taste of flavor. We'll come back to it, probably go around the wheel again and again, different layers, different takes, different aspects. Um, So stay tuned for more. If you want to take your assessment, reach out to me at be at defiantspirit.org. You can uh, jump over to the new site, defiantspirit.org. We'll get you an Enneagram assessment. I can either work with you, I can do a one-time consultation, or you can get you set up and you can fly on your own. Pretty soon you'll have the video, the workbook, the everything you need. For now, I'll get you the ebook and an IOU for the videos which are forthcoming. I just recorded like a hundred and some videos for all nine types. So we're getting close for um, official launch of the DIY version, but right now we can get you going and on your way. So reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. And until the next time, defy your number and live your spirit.